here's why we are outside. Heather has, that's, that's you, mm -hmm. Dr. High. Mm -hmm. uh, also. Also, Dr. High, same person. Yeah. Um, has come down with a respiratory ailment that we strongly suspect is at least what is being called the current variant of COVID. Well done. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and let's just update people on where we are with COVID. I would, you tell me if this doesn't match your, your sense of things. But our sense is COVID is very definitely not a highly deadly disease. And people were spooked into all sorts of dumb behavior with the false impression and in fact the cultivation of the impression that it was deadly including by treating people in ways that made them more likely to die and then counting those deaths as covid deaths rather than a iatrogenic deaths right but that said covid is not a nothing from our perspective we've had it we've had it a couple of times i don't know how many times because the tests are unreliable but we've each had it a couple times at least and the um, negative effect. The effects are substantial during the disease, and everything that I know from my work on telomeres tells me that the damage is not just occurring and then over when you get better. Not only are there holdover effects from COVID, but there is also the long-term degradation of your capacity to repair whatever tissues are under attack. Yeah, so when you say <clears throat> not as deadly a disease by a lot as we were led to believe, uh, you are um, also implying, but not it, it's not in that statement, um, something that you said very clearly um, somewhat early in our live streams, which is that just because a thing doesn't kill you doesn't mean that it doesn't bring death closer. Right. And in fact, almost every disease, even presumably something like a cold, does this so trivially that it's it's negligible in its impact. But the point, and you know, it, yep. if you have a bunch of damaging diseases and then you die because you don't look both ways and you get hit by a bus, obviously it didn't hasten your death. Right. But on average, you die from the failure of whatever organ is essential and collapses first, or you die of a cancer. That's yeah. basically the two general ways to die naturally. Yeah. And um, in the case that you die from organ failure, each organ has a capacity to repair damage and do maintenance, and that capacity is finite, and anything that does damage reduces it borrows from that account. And so, uh, you know, if you do a lot of damage to, let's say you do a lot of damage to your kidneys early in life, and then you wise up and you stop doing damage, you know, you can compensate a bit. You can't buy back anything you lost, but what you can do is you can reduce the rate of damage to below average and you can sort of catch up. But yeah. all of that and, said- And you can do that better in tissues that actually have some repair capacity and not in, for instance, the heart, as we have talked about a lot. Right. Even though your behavior should be the same. Right. You can't recover that capacity uh, by, uh, well, I guess you could reduce the rate of damage of your heart by being super vigilant of new damage to your heart. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the heart doesn't uh, repair in a classical sense. It scars over, which is still uh, uh, much better than having an open, open wound in your heart, which is a lethal vulnerability. But anyway, this is a bit of a digression. We treat COVID seriously, even though we don't fear that we're not going to get through a case of COVID. We just don't want to hasten our demise or decrepitude or anything like that by allowing extra damage. So anyway, when one or the other of us has this, and you know, we do this for other uh, ailments too. We might not do it for uh, a cold, but for any significant uh, disease, we tend to uh, isolate. And in this case, um, we needed to do a live stream and as uh, there was i want people to think back to early in our live streams we spent a lot of time pointing out that the advice the directives that we were being given the policy changes that we were witnessing made no sense the bulldozing of sand into skate parks right the stopping people from running on beaches and from surfing the closing of parks this was some of the earliest, most obviously completely wrong-headed COVID policy that was, frankly, part of what opened the door and opened many people's eyes to, well, if they're that wrong about those things, what else are they wrong about? 
Yeah, and let's just put it to you this way. Wrong isn't pointlessly wrong. The fact is, to the extent that there was some disease that we were trying to not catch, go outside was like killer advice. Go outside, right? Yep. Oh, your life is being disrupted. You're facing psychological torment. Go meet your friends outside. Too cold and rainy? Figure out how to do it. Right. So um, in any case, we are outside today because although you are you haven't had it very long, we treated you early, of course. Uh, I went on prophylactic treatment. Now, you and I were in close contact as you were beginning to come down with it. And so it's possible that I got it and I will uh, manifest symptoms. It's also possible I got away with it uh, or it's possible because I went on what we think is prophylactic treatment that uh, my symptoms will be so mild I won't even notice it. Um, but in any case, I thought it would be interesting in light of the fact that we are broadcasting from outside, solving a problem, which is how do we do our job while you may have a still active and contagious infection? Well, okay, this is imperfect. The lighting's not great. It's a little hot. Um, there are it's airplane noises. You, it's very nice to see you. It's great to sit next the to you. The last time we saw each other when we had to curtail uh, a short trip that you had planned for us was on our 25th wedding anniversary. Yep, 25th wedding anniversary. And it was a delightful trip, and I really wish it hadn't been cut short. This, you will all recognize, is our book, A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And this book contains an afterword, which I am now going to read, because it's what? This is not how you treat books. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how you treat books. Okay, well, um, <laughs> after the live stream, we will have a short tutorial on how we treat no, books. No, 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 we, we won't. We won't. No. Okay. No. All right. We're um, good. So, this is the afterword to Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And I will do my attempt to read it. In January of 2020, we went to the Tipitini Biodiversity Station in the Ecuadorian Amazon to finish our first draft of this book. When we emerged from our isolation, as our phones came alive for the first time in two weeks, we were confronted with a barrage of news, mostly trivial, of which we had been blissfully unaware. But in that onslaught, onslaught there was one ominous report, a case of a novel coronavirus in Ecuador. The pathogen came from horseshoe bats, had jumped to people, and then spread rapidly, first in Wuhan, China, and then beyond. As the two of us tried to make sense of these first hints of a pandemic, it quickly became clear that there might be more to the story. Wuhan, we so soon learned, housed a BSL-4 laboratory. It was, in fact, one of our planet's two main centers for the research on bat-borne coronaviruses. These viruses were being studied in Wuhan, Wuhan and in North Carolina because of fear among scientists that such viruses could jump to people and, without very much evolutionary change, cause a dangerous pandemic. If nothing else, the fact of the pandemic having begun in one of two cities where these viruses had been under intensive study seemed a particular coincidence. As of the writing of this note in late May 2021, the consensus in the scientific establishment, including national and international regulators and the mainstream press that follows them, has finally shifted to one of grudging acceptance of the obvious, that SARS-CoV-2 may well have leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and the COVID-19 pandemic might therefore be for humanity an entirely self-inflicted wound. The strength of this hypothesis is something we have been discussing on our podcast, dark horse since April of 2020. Those discussions caused a great deal of derision and stigma to be directed at us, and it is, bewilder it is a bewildering relief to watch the world suddenly come around to the plausibility of this well-supported, if unfortunate, explanation. But no matter what humanity ultimately concludes about the pandemic's origin, there is a deeper truth hovering just outside our collective awareness. COVID-19 is a product of technology, no matter what path it took to humans. Consider this fact. From the beginning of the pandemic, the virus showed essentially zero capacity to transmit outside. Put another way, COVID-19 is a disease of buildings, cars, ships, trains, and airplanes. More than 99% of the Earth's surface is a COVID-safe zone. Even in your own backyard, the virus will struggle mightily to infect anyone. It has no meaningful impact unless you caught it before you walked out. In the park, on the balcony, at the beach, we are, at least for now, immune. 
The dependence of the virus on enclosed spaces also means that had humanity agreed to avoid vectoring environments for a few weeks, the pandemic could have been quickly brought to a halt. But this scenario, in which we free ourselves and lock down dangerous environments instead, is little more than an idle thought experiment. Even though, in evolutionary terms, these dangerous environments are all brand new to humans, the idea of humanity staying outside them, even for just a few weeks, is unthinkable. Many individuals could do it, but a majority would be at a total loss, even though we evolved outside and despite the fact that most of our ancestors would have spent every hour of their lives in what we now strangely call the outdoors. We have forgotten the skills we once knew so well. That knowledge of and comfort with our natural environment has been replaced with a different skill set, one tuned to pursuing value and avoiding harm in a synthetic environment of our own device. Our cognitive software has been rewritten, and we have forgotten too much to ever again be what we were. The result, we are condemned to battle this pathogen in bespoke environments in which we and it have both grown to depend. That's the view from the ground, but, hum but the human dimension of this pandemic is even clearer from 30,000 feet, or more accurately, at 30,000 feet. For it is, <clears throat> excuse me, I have now, now reading in the shade here. For it is the way we have begun to travel that really sets us up for the pandemic disaster. SARS-CoV-2 crossed oceans in hours, and it didn't pioneer some ingenious new mode. Where once an epidemic might have been held back by barriers that limit human travel, humans now regularly transmit communicable diseases from their continents of origin to every corner of the globe. Much as people thought little about washing their hands prior to the germ theory of disease, we give no thought to the scale of misery caused by a given person transporting a new and nameless cold virus to some continent that was free of it the day before. Novel coronavirus took advantage of that nonchalance before the pathogen even had a proper name. The COVID-19 pandemic is, a self, is, it, is itself a symptom of another disease entirely. The pages of this book, we call that disease hypernovelty. It is caused by a uh, rate of technological change so rapid that transitions in our environment outstrip our capacity to adapt. You will not find the COVID-19 pandemic specifically dissected here, but you will find a full exploration of the hypernovelty crisis that left us vulnerable to this virus, a virus so weak that it could have been cured with a bit of well-coordinated fresh air. So, I thought that revisit was worthwhile. Mm -hmm in light of the fact that we are still all dealing with the consequences of this. The people who have decided it's no big deal that the world is over COVID and they're just not going to think about it, they're not going to do anything special, and the people who still treat it seriously, as you and I do, and the people who still panic over it and are wearing their masks uh, outside as they walk around. We still see these people occasionally. Yep. Um, the answer is there's actually a loophole with this disease. The fact that it doesn't transmit outside was a loophole and a properly run planet, a planet in which experts weren't just simply idiots who held a high position, would have told us, here is how you go about not disrupting your life. Try to figure out how to do as much as possible outside, and uh, we can retain as much normalcy as, uh, as we can arrange. But they didn't tell us that. No, they told us exactly the opposite. Yes, they told us, go inside, go home. Yeah. Go, go home, get the people you love sick if you're sick, uh, and uh, don't come back and see us until it's uh, close to too late, at which point we'll, uh, we'll inflict our worst harms on you. Yeah, we'll put you on a ventilator and give you remdesivir. Uh, I don't know when that started. That was, that was a little later, but, um, you know, since replaced with um, Paxlovid. But uh, um, none of the solutions, so-called, uh, have been actually solutions. And that, of course, as we have said over and over and over again, raises questions about uh, about why. Yeah. To, to what degree can we imagine that they were actually intended as solutions in the first place? Um, but here here we are in, uh, you know, in a, in a summer where for a lot of people it's been too hot, it's been too smoky, it's been, there have been too many fires um, to to go outside much, you know, it, that being usually the season when people um, go out and uh, re-up their vitamin D and such, um, still you should be trying. And, uh, you know, everyone's in a, in a, in a different, different locale, um, but your particular situation 
personal, social, social, emotional uh, should not be the one driving whether or not you should be going outside. If there, if there are reasons that you, that you can't be outside uh, because, because of fires, because of storms, whatever, um, that's something different. But um, really, the, um, the more time you spend outside, the more time you spend moving your body, um, being active, getting every part of you moving, uh, the healthier you're going to be. Thank you.